I'm going to give you more than you really need to know on this topic, but I think hope you'll find this interesting. I can't seem to put my hands on a just a nice piece of string, but I'll uh, I'll work with this. Here's a pretend this is a string, and it's it's actually part of a cabling to a, a scanner, but um, so the wire in here is a little bit of stiffness. It doesn't behave like the string I really wanted to, but but imagine if you just had a string and you let it sag loosely in between two points that are of equal height. Okay, so it droops down and comes back up again. That drooping down coming up is a shape we call a catenary curve. And uh, so let me, let me draw a catenary curve. Sags down, goes back up. It looks a lot like a parabola, but it's not a true parabola. Um, anyway, the, it turns out that if this has equal density, equal mass along the length of the of the string or the cable or, or whatever the material is, then the forces pulling it down, the gravitational forces, will pull it into this exact shape. And, um, and in fact, the, the forces are, are equal at any point along here. All the forces are equaled out. All right, so that's, uh, that's what's known as a catenary curve. Now, if you were a, an engineer, you would study this stuff, particularly if you were gonna build a bridge. There is a, a bridge, at least one bridge in Cincinnati I've seen that is a catenary. I think it's in Cincinnati, but somewhere in my travels this summer I, I noticed one, somewhere. And um, the bridge, now I'm sure you've seen bridges like this. Here is the roadway to the bridge, and then there's a, an arch span like this. And from the span are cables, coming very thick cables coming down which support the roadway. So this huge piece of metal is shaped this way in its arch and it has these very large cables coming down to support the roadway. And uh, it is a catenary curve because all along the roadway the stress on this frame is equaled out. In other words, there's no part on this frame that's taking more stress than another. So that's the advantage of the catenary curve. The St. Louis arch is, uh, is a catenary curve. Okay, because a uh, you know, catenary curve is about the most stable of those type of arches you could build due to the use of forces. All right, now what in the world does this have to do with what we're doing? Well, you have uh, some interesting functions that show up in your book, your textbook. And uh, this catenary curve has the form like this. It is, it's e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. And we call this the hyperbolic cosine. In abbreviation, it's cosh x. C-O-S-H x. So that means hyperbolic cosine pronounced cosh. And there's our familiar e to the x functions. So you can get a function like this by studying the physics of a catenary. This pops out. The other place where I've seen these types of functions appear is if you study an object falling, free falling through, through the air, and if you consider the air as pushing back wind resistance proportional to the square of the area of the object falling, uh, it, it turns out to be a horrendously long problem to work out. Uh, you would see it if you take differential equations from me, but it's a great problem. Uh, but you end up with these types of functions there as well. So. Anyway, there's the, the, the hyperbolic cosine, the hyperbolic sine function, pronounced sinh, is e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. It's related, of course, to cosine, cosh, the cosh function. There's another one called the tanh, T-A-N-H function. The tanh would be this one divided by that one. So anyway, um, you don't need to know these terms. For this course. Okay, if you take uh, calculus two or three, somewhere in there, these show up and, and you work with them a little bit. And then if you take uh, differential equations, you may see them again. So uh, but if you don't take calculus, this will probably be the last time you run into these. All right, so uh, in the book, they'll give you some interesting problems. And um, let me make up one. Let's, let's call it E to the x minus e to the minus x over e to the x plus e 
to the minus x equals, and I know I have one in my, my book, I want to make sure it's not the same one. Let's say this equals to 2. And we're going to solve for x. All right. So how in the world would you approach that? Well, it's if you recognize this as the hyperbolic tangent function, you literally could hit the inverse tanch button on your calculator for 2, and it would provide an answer, a decimal answer, right like that. So um, in its essence, we're going to do it the hard way because um, it's great math, <laughs> okay? It's great math to do it the hard way. It's not productive math to do a lot of them this way, but it's a good for you. So, so now we're to the point of this, this video and, and probably why they show up in your textbook is that uh, this is just a good workout with exponential functions. All right, so let's, let's talk our way through this. First of all, I'm going to clear the fractions, multiply both sides by the denominator, e to the x minus e to the minus x. So I get e to the x minus, oops, and I see I've made a mistake. I don't want to restart this video, so please, please make that a plus, and this a plus. Otherwise, I would have had 1 equals to 2. So start over a little bit. This is e to the, I have a minus here and a plus there. That is the hyperbolic tangent function. Okay, so um, make sure that's a plus in your notes. All right, um, so I multiply it by the denominator, and I get e to the x minus e to the minus x equals two parentheses e to the x plus e to the minus x. All right, not too bad. Let's combine terms. So e to the x minus e to the minus x equals, I'll multiply through here, 2e to the x plus 2e to the minus x. And then if we um, combine these, let's see, I'm going to move these terms over to here. So by subtracting e to the x, I end up with e to the x. And then if I add this term over here, I get plus 3e to the minus x um, equals to 0. Great. All right. Now, um, actually, this isn't, this isn't too bad to solve. I think uh, if you look at my book, I've solved a hyperbolic sine or hyperbolic cosine. That, that takes a little more work because those problems end up being quadratic forms, and you have to use a quadratic formula. So uh, it turned out I've, I've chosen a little easier one here. Now, you might wonder, well, what do you do with this? Well, here's the secret. If I multiply by e to the x... This will give me e to the 2x plus 3 equals to 0. Because, because e to the x times e to the minus x is 1. So I have e to the 2x plus 3 equals to 0. And then if I um, subtract 3 from both sides, there's going to be no solution, is there? So e to the 2x equals to minus 3, I have an exponential function equal to a negative. This problem has no solution, no solution to it. All right, so anyway, there's, uh, I, I honestly did not expect that result. And uh, let me see, let me see what happens on my calculator. So I have to find the inverse tanch button. All right, so bear with me. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay, log. All right, here, this should get me to it. All right, I found it. Inverse tanch of 2 is a complex number. All right, so um, my calculator gave me a complex number, literally 0.549 minus pi divided by 2 times i. Um, so that's why I got no solution here, because there's no real solution. We're not looking for complex number solutions. There is no real solution to this answer. So. Uh, that, that all made sense. 
Okay, well, um, a little bit of a mess, but um, but there you have it. Uh, the the secret on on all these type of ones when you get when you get an e to the x and an e to the minus x in the problem is ultimately it's going to turn into a uh, may turn into a quadratic form, but usually you have to multiply through by e to the x in order to cancel something there. So uh, look at my book; you'll find um, example there as well. Okay, well, that, that does it for this section.